Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 61 of the C-Suite Show, featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we're excited to have Bernard Golden back on the show as our special guest. Bernard is the Vice President of Cloud Strategy at Capital One Bank. He is a long-time tech innovator and visionary and is the author and co-author of five books including the best-selling cloud computing book ever Amazon Web Services for Dummies. Hi Bernard it's great to have you back on the C-Suite show this week and thanks again for joining us. Well thank you much so much for inviting me to uh, participate today. I can't believe how quickly that year's gone to be honest it's uh, that's unbelievable but welcome welcome back. Thanks. Hi Dave it's great to see you back on the show again this week thanks for being part of it. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's great to have an argument You're back, back after a year. Yep, absolutely. A warm welcome to you both. Look, in this week's show, we're talking about that according to a newly released report from consulting firm Ernest & Young, C-level executives say their organizations are spending more than 5% of their annual budget on innovative initiatives, and yet 42% stated a limited budget as their biggest barrier to activation. So, look, an opening question that's going to come over to you first then, Dave, is should the C-levels think differently about how they fund their cloud computing? Yeah, and Bernard had a good, we had a lively discussion that we're going to carry over to a recording where it talks about the fact that uh, 5% seems like an awful lot. And I think what it is, and kind of looking at it again, you know, if you ask a C-level executive, you know, how much are you spending on innovative initiatives? And they can say 5% because they'll probably throw in the fact there are RFID enabling things there, you know, doing some uh, basic cloud enablement stuff. They're upgrading their, their storage system. So, Bernard, I think that they're throwing all that into the 5%, so that's why it seems inflated to me. And so as far as net new innovative stuff, where they're actually building things that don't exist, I suspect that's way less than 1% uh, in the budgets that most people are doing. And I think what the you know survey does kind of bear out is the fact of the matter is that, that we're not necessarily spending enough on innovative topics in the space. And I think going forward, this is going to be a limitations of lots of companies out there. And if we're not able to innovate in the space, then we're going to be disrupted. I mean, um, you know, we had a show with James State and we, you know, looked at lots of different data points out there. People are not necessarily innovating to the degree they need to, need to innovate. And I think lots of companies are going to weaponize technology and come up behind them and displace them out of the marketplace. And I think so this is a matter of survival. And so I would like to see, at least from my perspective, a lot of the global 2000 companies out there, you know, start spending more money. And so, Bernard, you work for a company that does innovate and is, is kind of well ahead of its competitors. So, you know, what's your take on this? Well, you know, I, I, I do sort of think that 5% in most companies is, uh, that just seemed high to me. And that's why I mentioned it. What I'll say that, that, Cloud is pretty interesting. So C Capital One is all in on cloud computing. But I think the, the thing that what I observe or have observed in the past working with lots of companies is they make a fundamental um, sort of misperception or, mis or uh, misjudgment in that they go, oh, cloud computing is like my data center, but at the end of a wire. So I'm sort of outsourcing my, you know, racking and stacking and operations folks, and I'm going to continue to treat cloud as, you know, kind of the way I did in my data center. And I think that's a fundamental misreading of what cloud computing brings. Cloud computing transforms the way that you can do information technology. It's much faster. Hey, our cat decided to make an appearance. Um, and so, uh, you know, two guests for the price of one. Um, and and if you don't understand the, the key differences between the way cloud computing operates versus the way that traditional IT did, and the capabilities that it brings to you, you're not going to take advantage of it in a way that really transforms your industry or your business. Absolutely. Um, Firstly, I just want to say, true professional, Bernard. True professional. Well, I learned uh, my I learned my lesson from that BBC tape. Anyway, but what's interesting about that though is is if you sort of go, okay, I'm going to take advantage of cloud computing. I'm not going to treat it like the way just you know my data center at the end of a wire. That carries forward a logic that says I have to transform the complete way I run my IT through top to bottom. I have to change my development processes, my whole application lifecycle. I've got to go to DevOps. I've got to start treating this like it's like I'm a cloud native company. 
And then you have to extend that and say, now, how do I revisit the way I think about my, the, my, my offerings to the marketplace? How do I change the way I work with my customers? So it's a very top to bottom kind of thing. It's not just, oh, I'm going to do tech a little bit differently. And I'm going to look for cost savings because I'm going to use their stores instead of mine. And if you don't do that, you're not going to take, you're not going to carry forward this new kind of technology to do innovation. Kind of the 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 phrase, the catchphrase I use for it, the the way I sum it up is, um, the role of IT is changing from support the business to be the business. And if you don't rethink the way you're using IT to help it help you be the business then you're not going to get the advantage out of it that you need. And certainly in this world of sort of digital transformation, you're not going to get innovation the way you need it to take into the marketplace. Yeah, I can't disagree with any of that. I think that, uh, you know, ultimately this is about, you know, the degree of um, you know, desperation, you know, that need, that needs to be within a lot of these global 2000 companies. And I, I really think it's independent of cloud and edge technology and, Sorry, edge computing, IoT, and you know, uh, and machine learning, and you know, kind of all the buzzwords that are going on right now. I think this is a, a matter of them building something that's net new. But I do agree with you that the cloud enablement aspect of it would be the step in the what first step in the right direction. Because I can't innovate if I can't change anything. If I'm going through a six month hardware procurement cycle to get things up and running, or a month, you know, virtualization provisioning cycle to get you know, allocate the virtual machines that I need to make things happen, then I'm not going to be able to really kind of move as quickly as I need to move. And I think going forward, you know, this is really about two things. Number one, setting up the infrastructure, which is going to allow to compress time in the market, your ability to be agile, your ability to kind of take things quicker into the marketplace. And then the second thing would be the innovative people that are able to leverage this technology. I can't get enough of that. It cracks me up, Bernard. Uh, this is uh, definitely going to be the, uh, the the blooper reel going on at uh, Nelson Hilliard. So, but I can't, um, you know, look at, we, we need to actually have innovative people that are really kind of taking things to the next level. And that means hiring, you know, very talented, very, you know, forward looking people and understanding how we're going to take things in the market. People understand the technology and what's technology they can weaponize or making them force multipliers for these businesses out there. And I'm really kind of scared for them because these people employ millions of people, sorry, these businesses employ millions of people and they really need to be prepared to kind of take things to the next level. And I'm not sure they are. And I don't think they're spending enough money. They're kind of whistling past the graveyard. And, you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, my larger concern to the point that you know, I blog and speak about this all the time. And, you know, people agree with me, but I never th see things changing. So am I overly concerned, overly paranoid for these folks or? They are going to be able to weaponize technology such as cloud computing, kind of take the business to the next level. And I guess the, the big question for me, what would your, be, your advice be to them in terms of how to change and how to move forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I kind of look at cloud computing as kind of akin to the, ch the move to mass assembly in a manufacturing industrial economy. You know, when Henry Ford uh, put together the assembly line, he changed the rules for everyone who was a manufacturer. Because it used to be, you know, before he put that together, manufacturing was a very, you know, kind of you had you had people standing around and moving, walking over to piles of parts, and he changed the the dynamics of it. And if you were a company that didn't or couldn't adopt the assembly line mass mass manufacturing discipline, you were you were not competitive. And you know, like hundreds of car companies went out of business because they couldn't bring that forward. And I think you're you're what you're pointing to is kind of we're at that same inflection point for the digital economy. The rules are changing around doing doing it. The costs are changing dramatically. The skills that you need are very different. And you know if you don't put those together, yeah, you're going to have a real challenge being competitive in the marketplace. Um, you know what I always said when I was uh, before I you know joined Capital One when I was doing consulting um, or at the software companies I worked at was. You know, start start with a with a use case, execute, have it be sort of the full the full uh, dynamics of the use case. Meaning, don't just sort of say I'm going to have somebody throw up, you know, an application. Learn from that. So have 
you know, be drawing lessons out of that that you can apply across your entire IT organization that will affect every part of that life cycle and then capture those lessons so that you can then apply them to other organization, other parts of your organization so that you can then um, sort of say, okay, now I need to go replicate this. I've got the recipe. Let me go, you know, re replicate it, cook it again, you know, do it across my organization, build a center of excellence so that you have a, a key place where organizations, groups that are now coming, starting the process can go, how can I learn this so I don't try and have every group so that every group doesn't have to learn it th themselves and use that to replicate it. And then, of course, you have to have higher level support, meaning you've got to have senior level management, senior executives who are sponsoring this activity and kind of forcing it because left to their own devices, many people will say, gosh, that sounds like a lot of work. I'll just stick with the way I have always done things because that's a lot easier. So you've got to have, you know, a, a fu uh, fundamentals of how you're going to diff diffuse change throughout your organization. And then you've got to have sp senior sponsorship that's going to sort of enable that, invest in it, and push it, to be quite truthful, so that you kind of go, it's, we can't do business as usual. And, you know, you have to sort of decide, or if you're someone working that organization, am I going to get with the new program? Or am I going to find myself probably needing to go somewhere else? Yeah, I can't disagree with any of that. I think, you know, at the end of the day, they need to put the innovation into its own domain. So the C needs to be, you know, not trying to, in essence, grow innovation activities within the existing culture, you know, even the existing budgets. And so, you know, if you are going to create something that's going to be a net new innovation for whatever you are, a car, man car manufacturer, bank, uh, you know, um, a healthcare company, whatever, I think you have to kind of break off a group of um, people, you know, almost like a separate country, uh, company and it's able to kind of understand what the technology is, make the changes they need to make, you know, they're in essence, you know, going to be funded well and, you know, kind of the, um, you know, pride of the company for the next couple of years as they it kind of build something that's not new. And I think that the company needs to support them by changing the infrastructure. So they need to basically make the migration to cloud, that they typically already committed to do. They need to, in essence, make the migration to ML and the ability to kind of set up some of the big data stuff that's out there so that when this innovation folds back into the regular company, that they have the infrastructure to, to make the stuff work. And I think that if you're able to do that, that's really kind of your path to innovation. I just don't see a lot of companies that are breaking these things off and you know making things happen. I think ultimately this is a um, issue with the market starting to accelerate faster than the organizations can change. This is something that, you know, is not going to fix itself. I think the change is going to only accelerate as time goes on as the technology gets better. And, you know, we start accelerating the technology development, things like that. Organizations are in essence moving as fast as they've been moving for the last, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 50, 100 years. And so they're going to get left behind and they're going to find their displaced in the market. And then once they once they're displaced, they can't catch up. In fact, I'm I'm afraid that a lot of other organizations, some of the big brand name technologies, are already been displaced and won't be able to catch up ever. And so they just don't know, you know, they're dead and they just don't know it yet. And I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff, you know, kind of raise up, you know, over the next two three years. Yeah, you know, um, you know, a couple of things that you brought up. So one, that that sort of create the innovation group and then, you know, whatever, kind of sounds a little bit like um, what uh, Gartner calls bimodal IT. And they published, they sort of promulgated this a few years ago where you sort of have um, type one IT, which is kind of traditional, kind of ITIL oriented, stable systems. And then type two, which is agile dynamic. And they kind of said, you want to set up these two organizations. Very controversial. A lot of people didn't like it because they felt like it was kind of a sheeps and goats kind of thing. Um, I was always pretty sympathetic to it because, you know, you you can't – if you're a CEO and you say, we've got to start making change, you can't depend on saying, well, the first thing I have to do is just completely transform everyone and hope they get with the program. No, you need to start right away, and that gives you the proof points, which is sort of what I was talking about with the, you know, create the uh, initial – uh, success story. The place that that uh, Gartner doesn't really tie back to is what you said, which is, and then you eventually have to bring it into the organization. You prove it out, and then you've got to figure out a way to integrate that through the rest of your organization. Because if you're going to be a cloud-native enterprise, 
in the future, you can't say I've got this one smart group and then everybody else behaves the way it's always been. That won't get you where you need to go. You need to be, figure out, you know, this is I've proved it, I've started it, I've incubated it. Now I've got to bring it through the rest of the organization. And just to sort of, you know, what you talked about, I think you wrote about it in Brand Apocalypse. I think is what you called it. But uh, there was a publication, and uh, Brad, I hope you can put this into the show notes. Uh, that came out through this sort of the DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, initiative. It, it's called the DORA Report, which I think is like DevOps something research. And they and they looked at companies, and their conclusion was that companies that adopted more agile, more DevOps, more uh, forward approaches to IT actually outperformed financially, you know, both in sort of profitability and so forth, but also stock pricing companies that stuck with traditional IT. And so, you know, that sort of reinforces what you said, which is companies that adopt these new trends have um, fundamental outcomes that are superior to those who stick with the old way of doing things. And if you don't figure out a way to get with those new trends, those new capabilities, those new approaches, you're going to find yourself lagging behind in, in places that you don't want to be seen as lagging behind, like your stock price. Good to agree more. So, Brad, what's your take on this? Yeah, guys, you cover some great ground, as always. It's fascinating to listen to. Look, I think um, I always look at it like this, that your, your business is only as good as the user experience. And the user seems to be in a lot of control at the moment by you know, how they're communicating with the brand. We touched on this off camera. Uh, slightly, but I think it's it's very important that the the power in the the user's control over how successful a business can become or is perceived online is is amazing. Now I don't think it's ever been as strong where a brand needs to really define itself as the brand and not be um, reliant on a distribution because they can go their brand can go brands can go straight to the consumer now via social media, via influencers and things like that. So, you know, it, it's a formidable time when you're a business and you're not up with, say, your mobile technology or your Instagram presence and things like that. And obviously this is more the forward-facing front-end user point of view, which is where I'm adopting. And obviously the heavy lifting of the cloud is is behind all of this. And, you know, cloud has, has been a leveler for, for many organizations where you've got startups that can play with the big boys and be that bit more agile, quicker to market, etc., and and offer that dynamic. So, look, the way I see it is is that if you've got a brand it doesn't matter how big your brand is or um, how successful you have been in fact Dave you and I've spoken about this about companies that will be you know disintegrated before their very eyes because they just don't have the market presence to to captivate the user they're not second guessing how the user will interact with the brand or the product and I think that's that's key at the moment is not necessarily you know um, how big your IT department is it's what does your end user want to experience that that IT department can create with the tools that it's got. How the user, the expectation of the user from a, a social media point of view, which is more often than not the way they're accessing the brand, whether that's through a, a mobile app or whether that's through Instagram or an influencer, um, it, it's, really, it's really a turning point, I think, uh, majorly more so now with, with the way mobile apps have to be performing correctly to represent that user experience you know, losing data, crashing, not loading. It's, it's one of those things where you know, people will just delete the app uh, and move on to the competitor. You know, there's no real loyalty in that marketplace. And I think that's a, it's a concerning time for the bigger brands that don't have that mobile portability and that social media presence. So I'd love to know what you, you guys think of that. Maybe you, Bernard, first. It, it's very much all of a, of, a, of a totality. And I'm sort of saying that, you know, cloud is the foundation. You can't build a house or building without the right foundation. And the foundation for the future is cloud computing. But there's far more than that. You've got to as you know, sort of take advantage of that and build logic all the way up to the very top that enables you to be more agile around what you deliver to customers, change it more frequently, respond to, you know, changing consumer demands, so forth. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's absolutely the case um, that that you do that. And what I'll say is, if you are somebody who looks at cloud computing and says, "Oh, that's cheaper," you're looking at it the wrong way. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, ultimately, this is about uh, leveraging technology as a force multiplier and doing so in whatever ways you can do uh, to get it up and running in your tech in your company. And I think that people are far behind. Uh, they need to catch up, and that's really kind of the theme of this show. 
Yeah, absolutely. Look, guys, it's been a fantastic show as well. And uh, I'd like to, like to know your top three tips to, to close off the show, please, Dave. That'd be great. Yeah, first and foremost, it's an ex investment, not an expense. And so, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's 5%, 1%, 2%, no percent. You know, at the end of the day, companies need to invest in investing where their, uh, their companies are going and how they're going to leverage technology as a force multiplier or whatever innovative, innovative approaches they need to, you know, get their companies to the next level. I think people are kind of resting on their laurels, whether it's an automobile manufacturer, you know, telecom company, bank, you know, things like that. And this is about investing in really where the company is going to go in the next five, 10, you know, 15 years. And if they look at it as an expense, they're going to really kind of cut it every time they need to, you know, make their quarterly numbers. And I think that's going to be a, a step in the step toward death. Um, the market determines the investment. So, if you're in a uh, highly technical market, you're going to need to invest greatly in how you leverage your technology. Uh, Airbnb, Uber, you know, they disrupted, you know, a, a very disruptable space. But, you know, we're going to get into insurance and the banking, into healthcare, as I mentioned earlier in the show. And so you need to kind of figure out where your market's going and really kind of how you're going to get ahead of the disruptors. And then finally, never be afraid to go private in terms of a private company. A lot of these issues are the fact that we have to do quarter on quarter growth, you know, very much like Dell did and, you know, other companies of the same ilk. You know, they just said we're going to have to invest in technology in essence, retrench things and, you know, be good stewards of, um, of our, up to our shareholders. And, you know, this case, uh, you know, the employees of the company and, you know, people outside the company and uh, just go to a private kind of uh, business so they can, in essence, control their own destiny. And I think that a lot of companies are going to have to do that over the next five years because they're not going to be able to keep up with quarter and quarter growth. They're going to have some down cycles. They're going to have to retune the company. And then after you fix those things, you can go public. Yeah, here, here. Absolutely. Very good top tips there, Dave. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. And Bernard, thanks for being part of the C-Suite show this week. It's, it's great to have you back on. Well, Star and I both appreciate your invitation. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was classic. That really was. You, you styled that out pretty good. And I must admit, that is going to have to remain in the show. Although, if it happens for the training show, you must pick Star up and do that sort of James Bond baddie kind of thing where you're, you're stroking the cat, oh, yeah. talking about cloud superiority or something, um, or domination or something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I digress, but no, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure having you back on the show, and, uh, and obviously Star as well. We've got an extra special guest coming in, so that's great. And uh, Dave, as always, thanks for being part of the show. Peace, man. Thank you. <laughs> and you can get us all on Twitter. So um, at Bernard Golden on Twitter, at David Lindicum on Twitter, at Nelson underscore Hilliard on Twitter. Uh, there's lots of links in the description box below as well for all the social media. So check that out. Remember to like, to comment and subscribe to the channel. Uh, all your support means a lot to us. And, uh, and if you've just tuned into the C-Level uh, Management Show, the C-Suite Show, uh, remember to go back and watch the Australia Show because we spoke about some uh, very interesting topics there as well uh, that affects the global, not just Australia. So check that out. And we've got the training show coming up as well with, Gna uh, with Bernard as well. So that's going to be pretty awesome. So uh, look, until next week, thanks for watching. <laughs>